This is section four of part one of the vibrations and aeroelasticity cost unit. So in section four, we'll be looking at the general multiple degree of freedom system equations and solution. In the past sections, uh, in the past section uh, three, two and three in particular, we'll be looking at the approaches for discretizing a continuous system and then the methods for the derivations of the equations of motion using Newton's laws or Lagrange's method or employing the stiffness and flexibility influence coefficients. So in part four, sorry, in section four of part one, we are going to now look at the general multiple degree of freedom system equations and their solutions. So continuous systems are modeled as lumped multiple degree of freedom systems resulting in n degrees of freedom and n equations of motion. It is convenient to represent these equations by means of matrices. So this result in matrix equations of motion. Thus the general equation of motion in matrix form will be mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx equals f exponential j omega t. We are m, c, and k are the mass, damping, and stiffness matrices. These matrices are square matrices of order n by n. And x double dot, x dot, x and f, all with, with underlines, are the acceleration, velocity, displacement, and force vectors of order one by n, respectively. The steady state solution of equation 2.14 is of the form x equals a big X exponential j omega t minus phi equals x star exponential j omega t, where x star equals x exponential minus j phi. Now, this solution will be the steady state solution of equation 2.14 or mathematical terms would we'll call it the particular integral of equation 2.14. So if we substitute equation 2.15 in equation 2.14, then we will get bracket minus omega squared m plus j omega c plus k bracket closes times x underscore star equals f underscore. which you can rewrite at z x underscore star equals f underscore. Where z is the complex impedance and x star is a complex vector having amplitude and phase. But the presence of the phase angle phi in the solution is due to the presence of damping. If the damping term cx dot is missing, so if there's no damping in the system, then phi will become zero. So phi simply tells us the phase lag between the responses and the input excitation. So now we want to look at the free vibration of undamped multiple degree of freedom systems. And this will lead us to the determination of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the system. In other words, natural frequencies and mode shapes. So this is section five of part one. So the equation of motion of an undamped free vibrating MDOF system is obtained from equation 2.16 by equating the damping matrix C and the external forcing vector F to zero. Also, since there's no damping, the complex vector x star is replaced by a real vector x. Thus, the equation of motion reduces to bracket minus omega squared m plus k, bracket closes x underscore equals f underscore. There are two methods 
for determining the angle values or natural frequencies and the eigenvectors vectors or mode shapes from equation 2.18. Namely, the determinant method and two, the matrix iteration method. So we'll look first, firstly in section in this section 5.1 at the method for to obtain the eigenvalues and eigenvectors using the determinant method. For non-trivial solutions, the determinant method simply says that the determinant of minus omega squared m plus k equals to zero. So minus omega squared m plus k is our impedance matrix z. So the determinant method is straightforward because all it says is that the determinant of z, the impedance matrix will equal to zero. This results in the characteristic of frequency equation, which gives a polynomial in omega squared. The n characteristic roots of the polynomial provide the natural frequencies or eigenvalues. And this is best solved by substituting another variable for omega squared. For example, we let alpha equals omega squared so that our polynomial equation will be in terms of alpha. We can then solve for alpha and having obtained the values of alpha, we can then find the corresponding values of omega. We can of course solve the equation directly in terms of omega squared, but what should be avoided is solving the equation for omegas because only half of the values obtained for the omegas will be valid. The other half will be complex and will therefore not be admissible. Once we found the natural frequencies or eigenvalues, the next step is to find the eigenvectors or the mode shapes. And we find this, one of the approaches for finding this is by substituting the eigenvalues back into equation 2.18 above. So for each eigenvalues or each of the omega values of omega we find, we substitute the value of omega and then solve this equation for the value of the displacement vector x. But in doing this, we will assume that one of the elements of X is unity. So if it says three degrees of freedom system, for example, X, this amplitude vector X will consist of a one by three array. So it will be X1, X2, X3. So when we solve the substitute, for example, the value of omega one into this equation, then we can let x1 equals to one, and then we determine what x2 and x3 are. And we repeat that process for the next frequency, omega two, and then for the third frequency, omega three. The second method for obtaining the eigenvalues and eigenvectors is the matrix iteration method. And what we'll be looking here is the theoretical background, the theoretical basis for this method. So we start off with the statement of the eigenvalue problem. Minus omega squared m u plus k u equals zero. So what I've done here, I've, I've replaced x with u, but that does not matter because we can always use any variable to denote the displacement vector. So if we pre-multiply this equation by k inverse, then this equation will reduce to this statement of the eigenvalue problem du equals lambda u. Where d, the dynamical matrix, will be equal to k inverse times m, and lambda will be equal to one over omega squared. Now, any linear mode of vibration of a structure consists of a summation or contributions from all the other modes of vibration. And so for example, if you look at the general deflected shape of this structure here, it could be a skyscraper, which is being vibrated by the wind. And one of its general deflected shape 
under the wind conditions is this. We'll see that this mode, it's a very, it looks very similar to mode three, of the exact mode three of such a cantilevered structure with uniform properties. So what we say is that this, gen, uh, this general deflected shape of the structure can be represented as contributions from exact modes, mode one, mode two, mode three. From these three modes, the third mode will contribute the most because it looks very much like the deflected shape. The contributions from modes one and two will be minimal. In fact, mode two, contribution from mode two might actually be negative, but it will be very small. So by doing this, we can build up a representation for this deflected shape of the structure, which we will call the general trial vector, J sub one. J with a superfix one is the exact mode shape for mode one of the structure. U with a superfix two is the exact mode shape for the second mode shape, U superfix bracket three is the exact mode shape for the third mode of the structure. So what we are saying therefore is that generalized trial vector U1 can be represented as the modal contributions from mode one. So that contribution of mode one is represented by this coefficient C1 plus the contribution from mode two represented by this contribution factor C2, plus a contribution from mode three, represented by this modal contribution factor C3, plus contributions from the higher modes up to the nth mode of vibration, which you contribute um, Cn Un to the general trial vector. Now, if we pre-multiply the general trial vector U sub one by the dynamical matrix D, then we will get, we will obtain D U one equals C one D U one plus C two D U two plus C three D U three plus the higher modal terms up to the nth mode C N D U N. So all I've done there is to multiply each of these terms to pre-multiply each of these terms by the dynamical matrix D. Now, each of those terms, DU1, the first term DU1 can be replaced by lambda one, U1. Because right at the beginning, we've deduced the agam value problem statements at DU equals lambda U. So therefore du1 for mode one will be lambda one, u1. du2 for mode two will be lambda two, u2. And so on up to the nth mode dun will equal to lambda n, un. So if we now let du1, du sub one to equal to u sub two, and what does this mean? If we take the, model, the dynamical matrix D and post multiply it, by a vector u sub one, we'll get another vector. And we are calling that vector now u sub two. So u sub one is the initial general trial vector. u sub two will be uh, an updated form. It will be closer to what we are looking for to the, to the, to the mode shape or again vector we are trying to determine. So where u two is the second trial vector. Substituting equations, equations two, two, four, and two, two, five, and two, two, three will give us the following. So what we do here is we're going to replace in equation two, two, three, we are going to replace the D used by the, by the lambdas used. So in other words, in this equation, we want to replace D U one by lambda U one, D U two by lambda U two, D U three by lambda, 3u3 
and then d u n by lambda n u n. So making the substitution, we will get d u one equals u two equals c one lambda one u one plus c two lambda two u two plus c three lambda three u three plus the higher modal terms up to the nth term, which is the c n lambda n u n. But since lambda equals one over omega squared, then this equation two, two, six here can also be written as follows. So we replace the lambdas by one over omega squared. So we say d u one equals u two equals c one over omega one squared u one plus c two over omega two squared u two plus c three omega over omega three squared u three plus the higher modal terms up to the nth mode that term C n over omega n squared U n. Similarly, if we pre-multiply U two now, U two in this equation above by D as we did previously, then we'll get the following equation that D U two will now become U three and that will become C one lambda one D U one plus C2 lambda 2 du2 plus C3 lambda 3 du3 plus the higher modal terms plus Cn lambda n d u n, which we can rewrite as, so we we'll replace again the du, so we replace du1 by lambda 1 u1, du2 replaced by lambda 2 u2, du3 we replace by lambda 3 u3 and so on. So therefore, this equation here will become, this expression here will become C1 lambda one square U1 plus C2 lambda two square U2 plus C3 lambda three square U3 plus, plus Cn lambda n squared UN. And again, we can replace lambda by one over omega squared. So lambda one squared will become one over omega one to the fourth power. So therefore this expression will become C one over omega one to the fourth power U one plus C two over omega two to fourth power U two plus C three over omega three to fourth power U three plus the higher modal terms up to the nth term which will be C n over omega n to the fourth power U n. So this is the second step of the iteration. The first step of the iteration gave us equation 2.26, which we wrote as the equation below it. The second iteration now has given us this series of equations reducing to this. So what we now notice is that from the first iteration, the first iteration, the frequencies were squared. But in the second iteration, they are now raised to the fourth power. And if you can carry on with that process, then we can see that the pith iterative step will give us the following equation. DUP equals UP plus one equals C1 over omega one to power two P U one plus C2 over omega two to power two P U two plus C3 over omega three to power two P U three plus all the higher order terms and up to the nth term, which will be C n over omega n to power two P U n. Now, what we would observe is that the frequency coefficients one over one, one over omega one to power two P, one over omega two to power two P and so on, can be related by these inequalities. So because omega one is less than omega two, therefore we can conclude that one over omega one will be greater than one over omega two. Consequently, one over omega squared will be much greater than one over omega two squared. So hence, one over omega one to power two p will be much greater than one over omega two to power two p, which will be much, great, much greater than one over omega n to power two p. Therefore, equation two, two, seven above, this equation above will become 
U P one U P one equals to the first term, and that is because the frequency coefficients of the higher modal terms are negligibly small in comparison. So U P one equals C one over omega to to power two P U one. Thus, the P plus one trial vector is identical to the first mode to within a multiplicative constant. That is, the iteration converges to the first mode. An additional iteration step will yield the following result. UP plus two will equal to C1 over omega one to, to power two P plus two. U1. Therefore, if the columns, if the column vectors UP plus one and UP plus two are normalized in the same way, then we will get the ratio for the normalizing constant as one over omega one squared. In other words, if we divide the coefficients C1, C1, over omega one to power two p plus two by the coefficient c one over omega one to power two p, then we'll get one over omega one squared. So in other words, this iteration process will yield for us simultaneously the eigenvalue lambda one, which equals to one over omega one squared as well as the eigenvector u1 simultaneously. The way this works will soon be seen from examples, from worked examples. Thus the iteration process also yields the first natural frequency. It should be noted that this method is error-free if the dynamical matrix D is properly evaluated, that is, an error made in the iteration process merely slows down the method, but it will converge to the correct values. If the inverse u equals lambda inverse u is used instead, the iteration process will converge to the highest eigenvector and the highest eigenvalue of the system. It should be noted that this matrix iteration method is also known as the power method, especially in mathematics. So, the eigenvalue problem statement du equals lambda u, if we use that as the basis for our iteration, then it will convert to the lowest mode, provided that the trial vector u is well chosen. On the other hand, if we use the inverse, that is d inverse u equals lambda inverse u as the starting point for our iteration, then it will convert to the highest mode of the system. Again, if we select the trial vector u properly. On the other hand, if the trial vector u is close to an intermediate mode, then du equals lambda u or d inverse u equals lambda inverse u will converge to that mode of vibration. So this is uh, the end of this particular video in which we have looked at the methods for obtaining the general solution of multiple degree of freedom vibrating systems. And secondly, we looked at the methods for determining the natural frequencies and mode shapes. So the two methods for doing this are the determinant method and the matrix iteration method. The determinant method is a very straightforward method because we invoke uh, the uh, principle of uh, the non-trivial solution, which requires that the determinant of the impedance matrix should equal to zero. So that will result in the polynomial equation of omega squared, which as I explained earlier, should be recast in terms of alpha. We should let alpha, for example, equal to omega squared. And then we solve the polynomial equation in alpha for the roots of alpha. The alternative method, uh, 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 no, actually, so once we find the values of alpha, 
we will then use substitute each of the values of alpha back in our original equation to determine the corresponding eigenvectors of mode shape. Then the alternative method for determining the natural frequencies and mode shapes or eigenvectors and eigenvalues is to use the matrix iteration method. And the theoretical basis for applying that method has been illustrated. The beauty of that method is that it finds or it determines the natural frequency and mode shape simultaneously. However, it does this one mode at a time. And therefore it is quite amenable to implementation on, on a computer via an algorithm. 